done for me. Freedom, here I 
Goodness. 
one of the things I always really enjoy here at Southland is hearing your stories and what God is doing in your life now and how he's changed your life. But, but the best part of it is that then you tell your story to someone else and invite that person to come be part of this and they find the Lord here and, and it's just so cool to be part of that. We're all in this together and so I'm just grateful. I'm going to say that to you. Thank you so much for the way you enthusiastically tell your story of, of redemption, of transformation, of freedom, and freedom from addictions, and, and just the past, and how God has helped you through loneliness and struggle and grief. Um, that's what we find here when we talk about God's Word, and we discover that Jesus has a lot to offer us, and that's really what the series is going to be about over the next few weeks. What are some of those offers that Jesus presents to you and lets you take them if you want or reject them if you want? Um, th there was a really interesting story I read this week of George Gallegos, who's the CEO of Jitterbit, was telling a story about when he was doing sales with a team of people, and they were on a conference call with one of their customers, and, and it would go back and forth with turning on the mute button, turning off the mute button, and everybody had to make sure they synchronized that correctly. Well, their customer at one point forgot to turn on the mute button, and they were able to hear everything they were saying about how much they loved the product that Gallegos' team was going to sell them. And he said, you know, the negotiations were really tough until that point, but at that point, we knew we had them, and we knew we were going to make that sale. Now, here's the moral of the story. Always make sure the mute button is on. Now, now here's the thing, though. Today and throughout this series, the mute button's going to be off because Jesus wants you to hear these amazing offers. And not only that, he wants you to know this. Get this. And every offer is free. It's all free if you want to take it. Now, I think as we plow through some of these passages together, we're going to find out that these are pretty amazing offers, and we'll not only want them for ourselves, but we will want to give these offers to other people. So today, I, I, I want to start where, we, where I try to go once or twice um, a year, and that's to Luke chapter 15. And why do I love that chapter? Because it really has three stories of what God's love for us is all about. Um, the interesting thing about it, Jesus is again hanging out with the social outcasts of his generation, of his region. And in typical fashion then, the religious types, the guys who are the protector of all the rules and enforcing the rules, are being very critical of him. As, as a matter of fact, in Luke 15, 2, it says that th they said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, understand, that's the ultimate insult because they're talking about the fact that Jesus doesn't just talk to these social outcasts. He actually hangs out in an intimate way with them. To actually eat with someone or have dinner with someone showed a very close relationship that you had validated that person as a human being in your life. And so they're trying to criticize him for something we think would be great. Now, having a meal with somebody, it, it says a lot to the community around you about how you feel about that person. And as, many, as with many of his parables, Jesus had two purposes. First, he wanted to let sinners know, or people who are broken, or people who are failures, or outcasts, he wanted them all to know how much they were loved by God. But there was a second important point, too, and that was to show the spiritually arrogant that they're farther from God than the sinners that they're trying to avoid. Now, you say to yourself, spiritually arrogant, what does that mean? Well, stay with me, and I think you'll be able to see from Jesus' storytelling what spiritual arrogance is all about. Now, in, in, this, in this passage, in Luke chapter 15, there are three parables. All three go the same direction or have the same outline. Something or someone is lost... There's an all-out search that goes on for what is lost or who is lost, and ultimately there is a big celebration when what was lost is found. All three stories have that same outline. And with that in mind, I'm going to take you to the third one that we try to visit over and over again, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, I want to tell you, though, I've renamed it. It's not the parable of the prodigal son. It's the parable of the prodigal son's 
we need to read the whole story and you'll find out what I'm talking about. So if you have a Bible or a device with the Bible on it and you want to read along, if you want to read in your own translation even, I'm going to start with verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons, and the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. Now about the same time as money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. Now the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. And when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found, and I love the way the New Living Translation says it, so the party began. The party began. Now remember, Jesus is talking to two audiences. The part of the parable speaks to both, and especially those who are far from God. He shows them that no matter what you've been told, you're free to choose your own attitude and chart your own path. You know, you get to decide where you're going to go in terms of your, your vocation, your future, who you want to listen to as to right and wrong, good and bad, true and fake. And again, Jesus' parables were stories to show us how God designed us to think and believe and then ultimately to live. God had a design that went into each person in this space and with us online. In the prodigal son's all three characters matter a great deal. Of course, the Father is the Lord God. That's who we understand in Jesus' story. He is the designer of everything. And then the inheritance itself was for the second of two sons. That was the focus. Now, you'll notice in the passage, though, that he said he divided up his wealth between his sons. So the older son got his, and the younger son took his one-third. As it was in the custom of this generation, a, 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 the oldest son would get twice as much as everybody else who inherited. And so there were two sons. He got two-thirds. This son got one-third. And honestly, it would shock the crowd who was listening to this story Jesus was telling that this son would go to his father demanding his inheritance before his father died. Now, when he leaves to go find himself, he is assumed to have taken a lot, that his father was a wealthy man, and he then got a lot from the stuff he acquired. Even the outcasts of society, though, would have thought this kid was the worst, disrespecting his father, disrespecting his culture, disrespecting their values. But here's the thing. Even those in the crowd who were rebellious themselves could relate to this. They could see themselves as saying, you know, if I could get mine now, I'd take it now, no matter how disrespectful or countercultural that is. And look at verse 13. It says, he squandered his wealth in wild living. I don't need my father's traditions. I don't need my family with outdated confining values. No one is going to tell me what to do. And I love it how Jesus does not define wild living. He gives every listener the opportunity to define that for themselves. Because you know what wild living has taken place in your life 
where you've wandered from God. But he also relating to that idea that, hey, we all want to be the boss of ourselves, don't we? We all don't want anybody telling us what to do. We don't have, like to have confining rules or boundaries around us. And therefore, we all can relate to the son who is getting his now from his dad. And in Jesus' story, the son had no plan, no goal except to escape the father's rules, expectations, and control. He even wanted to escape his love because men and women, you need to know this. The expectations of God on all of us are motivated by his love for us. Everything that he set up for us to know and understand and follow in the Bible, in his word, is motivated by his love and compassion and care and concern for us. And and it's interesting, I have to be honest with you, the stories that I've heard from people on why I left Jesus— you know, why I walked away from my faith that I grew up with. And and it's so interesting because usually those stories consist of one or more of five categories. Those five categories are, first, I followed friends who just didn't care about Jesus, didn't even know Jesus, weren't interested in Jesus. That was category number one. Number two is that I made a poor decision, which led to more poor decisions, And I just continued to spiral and didn't know how to get out of that vortex. Number three, I didn't like rules. I saw God as a cosmic killjoy, and I just wanted a lot of fun. Number four, I left Christianity because of the behavior and attitudes and words and actions of other Christians. I saw them as hypocritical, and I wanted nothing to do with that. Or fifth influencers in my life convinced me that it just wasn't true, that it just wasn't real, that it just wasn't right. Now, ultimately, each person in those five categories wanted one thing, autonomy. They wanted to be able to make their own choices about life and didn't want to fall under anyone else's leadership or expectations. I don't want outside sources to control me especially my attitudes and my actions. Now, men and women, maybe you've been there. Uh, Honestly, maybe you are there. I mean, maybe right now you ended up here today because someone invited you or you just want to be nice to grandma or whatever it was, and you ended up here today and you find yourself in the place of that younger son. You find yourself as a person who's wandered away from the values you were brought up with, the way you were taught, you didn't want anyone to control you. And so Jesus says, I get you. You know, this guy is a lot like you. And we are humans who like freedom. Now, we value the word freedom, don't we? We love that word a lot. We don't want to be under the tyranny of someone else. But we can also value the word freedom as escaping all all expectations upon me so I can do what I want when I want to do it no matter who it hurts so maybe you concluded faith in Christ is confining you are exactly the person Jesus wants to talk to with this parable he's just asking you to reconsider where you are right now and he wants to offer you something better in your life now and forever. And maybe it's time for a change. Maybe it's time for a return. You know, the the way Jesus worded it is, is he said, this younger brother came to his senses or came to himself. Actually, there's a word for that. It's called repent. It's a word that simply means I change my mind in the direction I'm going, and I'm going to go in a different direction. This is what Jesus is offering to everyone who's wandered far from him. In Jesus' story then, the boy's life crumbles. Well, okay, dad's money runs out is actually what happens. And Jesus puts him at the lowest of the low, tending pigs. Now, you have to understand how low that is in this culture. I mean, a Jew would not not only eat a pig, but wouldn't even be seen with a pig, doesn't even want to see themselves a pig. And he's telling this story to a lot of Jewish people. 
and they would be mortified that that's how low this guy had gotten, that he was working for a farmer who was raising pigs, and he was responsible to feed them. And it's interesting because Jesus, to the Jews listening, this was not only appalling physically, it was appalling spiritually, morally, culturally for them. It's not just gross, it was a violation of all of their standards. The kid in their mind got what he deserved because of how much disrespect he showed to his father. Have you ever been there? Where you're like, you know what, that person got just what they deserved. You know, good for them. I'm glad there's justice in the world. I mean, have you ever felt like that about somebody or someone? That's what Jesus is pointing out to them because he was relating to exactly what many of them would have been feeling. Still, dad's love remains because it's real love. It's a father's love. It's the holy father's love. And when the son figures out a plan to return home, he sets off hoping to take nothing more than a humble servant's role in his father's house. But dad was having none of that. Uh, look again at verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Y you see, here's what Jesus wanted these people to know who'd wandered far from God. That when you recognize you've walked away from God, he's thrilled when you change your mind and come back to him. Thrilled. He's looking for you. He's not ready to condemn you, cause you to feel even more guilt and shame than you're already feeling. His arms are wide open just waiting for you to change your mind and come back home. Now, some people reduce this parable to mere sentimentality. I mean, you know, it's a movie of the week, right? Lots of crying, big emotion here at the end. You can even see the slow motion, right, as the dad is running toward the son. Great music going on in the background. And, and here's what can happen, though. As we, as we think through that moment, you know, the, the intensity of the emotion, we can get lost in focusing on the right things because of the emotion. So set the emotion aside just for a minute and emphasize in this moment the grace of the Father. The grace of the Father. See, after everything he'd done, Dad doesn't just take him back. He goes bonkers with joy at just seeing him. This is where his heart was all along. Not in finding a way to yell at his son for all of the bad choices that he'd made, Rather, this is the heart of God wanting so much to throw his arms around his son. He was looking for him. That's why it said when he was still far off. Why would he have seen him? Because he was always looking for him, always waiting for him to come back home. And Jesus said this guy had gone to a distant country. And that was an intentional word. Because he's trying to show that no matter how bad you've gone, how far you've gone from God, no matter how bad it's been, no matter how difficult or poor the choices were that you made, God is calling you back to him, back to forgiveness, back to grace. He wasn't just geographically far. He was relationally far. He was spiritually far from God. So for the average person, Many of us would be so hurt, so broken, so offended by this that we could never forgive this kid for what he'd done, let alone allow him to move back into our house as our son. But that's another thing about God's design. It comes complete with incredible grace and love. He's created a place to welcome those who have run away from him. Today, if you're someone who you know have, you've wandered from him, maybe you've even wandered away from him and you're the only one who knows it. It's what's going on in your mind and in your private world. He wants you to know you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay far off. You don't have to stay lost and broken. He's ready for you. He's searching for you. He's running toward you with forgiveness and mercy and grace and love. <laughs> 
It's okay if you're that person because he wants you to know you can always come home. And maybe you haven't had to take a farm job full of dirt and mud and dung and slop. You know, maybe your life hasn't gone to that low ebb, but you know you're far from the Father. Wherever you are in this journey, he wants you to know he wants you to come back home and we're thrilled when you do it. And perhaps you're here in this right now and realize that you've ended up in a place intellectually or spiritually that you don't want to be. Far from him. He has an offer to welcome you home. And he has an offer to help you to change. Now, you know, it was, it was wild for, um, for a part of the, min- the years of ministry I've served. Um, I was over young adults, so that would have been college, 20-somethings, uh, in our church. And how many of them had left high school firm in their faith, you know, they were going to go to college or the military or into their career, and they were going to be a shining light for Christ, you know, and they were going to follow him, and only to be be pulled into the vortex of all of the thoughts and, and philosophies and behaviors of the people that they were going with. And they said they've tried a lot of stuff, but that stuff never filled what was missing in their life. And they realized what they had given up was really what they wanted all along. But it it happens, right? We want to chart our own course. We want to figure stuff out for ourselves, And so it's easy to set aside what our parents taught us, what our church taught us, uh, what other adults in our life taught us. And we get out there thinking that all of these unexplored things will fulfill us only to discover What we've always wanted is what we've always had. If we would just embrace it again. Because what they really wanted in life was purpose and fulfillment and forgiveness and peace and real freedom. That freedom from guilt. To not have to live in the shame of the decisions that they made. And when they stopped to think about it, they remembered They remember that I'm created, and it's not by an accident. I'm here because of God, and God loves me, and I can trust him. Why would I ever want to walk away from that? And when I followed Christ, I knew joy and peace and purpose and strength, and so I'm ready to change back. I'm coming back. I'm running back to what I knew all along was what God designed me for in the first place. And I found him happy to see me. And I was happy to see him. See, those are great and real stories that I've heard in my life. But but wait, remember, the parable is actually the prodigal sons, plural. And so we've got to keep reading. Pick it up here with Luke 15, verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working, and when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry, and he wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He, is lo- he was lost, but now he is found. You see, this is what Jesus wanted all of them to know. That you can embrace God's celebration or your condemnation. It's totally up to you. Because we all can get an attitude toward those people who've walked away from that which they should have known. Look how Jesus worded the older brother's response to the party being thrown for Junior. He became angry and refused to go in. Now, it sounds like another son who doesn't want to come home. 
A good thing has happened for his brother and his father, and yet he can't see it. He's too busy judging him for all of the poor choices that he made. And his anger motive was motivated by condemnation and spiritual superiority to his younger brother. He's never let go of the bitterness toward his brother since the day that he left. And he's disrespectful, he's irresponsible, it's inconceivable that he would make those choices, and that was all true. So on his high moral ground, he can't let go of his fury toward his brother and his decisions. And on top of that, dad throws a party for him. A party. Like, why in the world would he ever do something to celebrate this piece of trash? Well, it's not fair, he's saying. Oh, I, I know, and I know no one else in this room has ever said those three words. It's not fair. It's just me, so I'm just up here having my devotions. Why a celebration instead of condemnation? I mean, how can he, his dad, do this in this moment? Well, because we all have a choice. We can sit in bitter judgment on those who have left home or celebrate when they return and have the same heart of God, that, heart that God has for them when they are far away from him. Of course, the father, Jesus' main character, is always waiting to throw this party. He's always waiting for you to return, to come back to him. He's ready to celebrate. But older brothers, <laughs> well, they get confused when their hard work for old dad seems overlooked. While the father pleads for the older son to come in and celebrate his brother's return, and look, see, even the father ran out to the older brother as well. He ran to find him and invite him in. All the brother can think about is how dad doesn't seem to notice his faithfulness. It's all about me. I've slaved for you all these years, and you've never thrown a party for me, he said. And there it is, not serving his father out of love and respect and gratitude, but serving him out of a perceived duty, an expectation, an obligation that he put on himself. And when he could have been enjoying his daily walks with his dad, he only focused on the work of it. You see, this party for his wayward brother simply exposed his own lostness. For just as the younger brother humiliated his father when he demanded to take his inheritance and ran, now the older brother disrespects him by refusing to come into his house to celebrate at the biggest feast his dad has ever thrown. See, can you see it now that the way you see others is a reflection of your appreciation for God's grace for you. Can I say that again? The way you perceive others is a reflection of your appreciation for the grace God has given you. Huh. And just as the younger brother was always free to come home, the older brother is always free to drop the condemnation and join the celebration to join the party. Now, I get it. You know, you might be saying to yourself, yeah, nice story, Steve, but, but, but wait, really, how does any of this answer the question, should I care if others choose to change? Why is that on me? Well, if God is on an all-out search for lost people and has a party ready for them when they come to him, then you and I can have that same passion in our heart. We can care deeply about people who haven't yet discovered that God has created them with a design and with a purpose and with a calling and a will that they can come to enjoy. We have this amazing story of walking with the Lord ourselves. Forgiveness, redemption, and men and women, it's meant to be shared with other people with the other younger brothers out there. And it's meant to be shared with all the older brothers who have spent their entire lives trying to prove that they are owed something by God because of their faithfulness. 
and they look down their noses at those who have crumbled in their choices. You know, it's, it's interesting to me, um, in my early years of ordained ministry, um, the people who were the leaders in my life at that time were all very rigid preacher types. I mean, they had all of the rules down, and it was all about preaching the rules. And they wanted to make sure everybody fell in line and fell in step. And if you were out of step, man, they came at you with the long, bony, condemning finger. And those guys were tough. And yet it's interesting, in now these years later that I've talked to them and listened to them tell their stories of ministry, they've all softened. They've all softened in their rigidity, and they focus more on the love and grace and mercy of God. Now, it's interesting when you talk to those guys and they say, what I've discovered is that I was the older brother. I was a pastor who was supposed to be sharing the great gospel, and here I was doing nothing more than condemning people for their failures and their mistakes. And I just have a question for you. When was the last time your criticism of someone led them to Jesus? When was the last time your condemning words drew someone closer to the Lord? You see, you stand the older brother next to the father, and there's a big attitude difference toward the failure of the son. Now, don't misunderstand, men and women. Jesus was always honest with people about their sin. It's not at all like he was saying to them, just overlook their sin. No, no, he was emphasizing to them that the heart of God is that they would what? Change their minds and come running to him and the life that he had designed for them, which would bring them great strength and joy. Jesus always pointed people to grace and forgiveness, even when they were convicted of their sin. He would never condone poor choices or sinful choices, but he definitely wants you to receive his amazing grace. Now, all of us who know the Lord's gift of salvation have this tremendous opportunity to exchange our condemnation of the lost for the celebration of their being found. But only if we choose to get involved in the search, only if we throw our arms open around those who need Jesus the most and offer them the chance to change, to put in front of them this beautiful, loving Jesus Christ who's offering them a new start, a fresh start, a, a changed life. And whether you're far from God today or you're mad at someone else who's far from God, both of you today can receive Jesus' offer to change. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, in this moment, there are people in this space and with us online who are feeling a sense of guilt, knowing that their choices have been far from what you've wanted from them. Lord, we confess to you that we've lost sight of your holiness and your love, lost sight of the fact that you can be trusted more than anyone with our lives. So forgive us for that. And I pray in this moment your Holy Spirit would call people home, would help people change. Lord, Show us today you're ready for us to come running to you. And I pray for those who are the judgmental ones, who've walked with you and yet don't understand why you would bless anyone who isn't walking with you. Lord, fill their hearts with your love and compassion as well. Wash them of condemnation and fill them with celebration. So help us to pray right now. What, whatever it is that we need, we pray you would sh put it on our mind and on our lips to share with you. You go ahead and pray. What is it that you need to pray about in response to this? If you're someone who's far from God, maybe just a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, you know everything about me. You know everything I am. 
everything I've done. I receive your forgiveness today. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Now help me, Lord, to live for your glory. Go ahead. You pray the way you need to pray in response to what you heard this morning. Jesus, this great grace, and we say thank you. We pray, Lord, that in this moment you would help all of us to enjoy the party, to realize that your arms are strong and that you can keep us in your care. We are yours. Use us so that you're lifted up and everybody's drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we, we build these altars people to just come and say, Lord, here's my life. I, I, forgive me. Take, take control of me. Help me with my relationships or whoever it is you need to bring, whatever it is you need to bring. We're going to sing, and if you'd like to use this space and use these altars, we'd love it if you come and bring whatever is on your heart to him. Let's stand and let's worship him together.
are celebrating so much here in life transformation at Southland this past week. We had a week of vacation Bible school. It was amazing, and it so loved those children hearing the gospel for the, maybe some of them the first time in their lives. And here's another beautiful thing about it. They responded with generosity. Um, we were receiving an offering all week long during VBS, and e- and the children brought in over $1,600, which will allow three orphans to go to school for a year. That will give, give a full education for them. So excited about that. We're celebrating that. Also, our middle schoolers this week just got back from camp. We had 10 middle schoolers go to camp this week. Six of those, 10 that went, rededicated their life to Christ. Three received Jesus for the first time in their lives. Three of them were baptized at camp. Three more are going to be baptized in our next baptism service. So we're just celebrating with Pastor Nate and Chelsea and all the team uh, who, who were part of that camp. And we're praising God for that. People's lives are changing here. And, and we're so excited about it. I hope that you'll want to be part of what God's doing at Southland all week long. Um, even with those of you with us online, I hope you'll come back tonight at 6 o'clock and hear John Brockman Crane talk about the topic of sex and purity. For some of you, you're like, you know, I've already settled that for myself. But listen, he'll help you learn how to talk to other people about it, how to talk to your kids about it, your friends about it. So I encourage you to come back tonight at 6 and be part of of that session and then Friday if you if you like good harmony quartet harmony you want to be part of that concert Friday night and uh, just go on our web page southlandchurch.org to events and buy a ticket and be here for that for that fun evening of worship those of you online thanks a lot for being with us today stick around for just a minute so you can hear a little bit more about how you can respond to what you experienced today in worship at Southland God bless you have a great week